Hello, friends, and welcome back to Five Agendas. Are you ready for part two? This is the June 15th thought paper. The Eternal Son Doctrine, crucifying Christ afresh, putting Christ to an open shame, the unpardonable sin, part two. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, which reads, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Hebrews 6, 4-6, that on first consideration is straightforward. But those, sorry, but does it have an ultimate spiritual calamity and final meaning? Yes. The eternal sun doctrine, as discussed above, and that doctrine has one major problem. It is to be crucifying Christ afresh and denying his eternal identity. You put him, his eternal divinity, to an open shame. Firstly, but for those acquainted with Hebrews 8 and the Sanctuary Doctrine, as well as Hebrews 7 and the Doctrine of the Eternal Melchizedek, as has been mentioned numerous times and also in this discussion, many may or may not be aware there is the time scenario known as the sealing time of Revelation 7. And with this sealing, it has a peculiar aspect. Few expect, which is that belief of the eternal Son doctrine is to put Christ to open shame. Yes, it is shameful. During the sealing time, it may not be apparent. Paul is saying in Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, that anyone can unseal themselves. Thankfully, God intervenes with the loud cry of Revelation 18, that the awareness of the unpardonable sin is once more made plain. The problem is not all will respond. But notice the impossibility that equals Matthew 12, 31, as written in Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to him, put him to an open shame. What is the falling away? It is the falling away from the first angel's warning, which says, Fear God and worship him that made. What? How? The facts are Christ was the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13 8. He is pictured in Revelation 5 as the Lamb slain before the throne. John said he was the Word and was with God in beginning. John 1 1 to 3. There are two eternal fathers, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Not father and son, Anarche, in beginning, which is John 1, 1 to 3, 
but the word, Logos, and God, which means there was no father-son relationship, reveal in John 1, 1 to 3. The gospel emphasizes Christ was the root of David, Revelation 5, 5 to 7. And he was to be called the Son of God from Bethlehem, which is Luke 1, and not from eternity, which equals the seed of David, Romans 1, 3 and 4. Christ said he is the Alpha and Omega, having no beginning and no ending. A falling away from the first angel's warning is the worst case spiritual scenario at the time known as the sealing time, which is Revelation 7, right now. The diabolical issue of the eternal Son doctrine is to be crucifying Christ afresh. It is the denial of the plainest facts about his eternal identity and to then bring a hardness of heart against the true Shema. John 1.1. 1, 1. The impardonable sin means one will then to settle on the false Shema as applied by the eighth king of Revelation 13 who is also the guy in 2 Thessalonians 2. Rather than the true Shema of the New Testament which is John 1, 1 to 3. Which means Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 has elevated to another entire level of shame, which is to crucify Christ afresh and bring his eternal identity to an open shame. It's the sin against the Holy Spirit, the unpardonable sin, Matthew 12, 31. When enlightened on the air of eternal sun doctrine, the doctrine of the little horn, adopted from Platonism, the same doctrine is at the very core of the Arian teaching. But worse, it is as found in fundamental belief number four. Well, here is a huge problem. This belief is the central doctrine of the Second Thessalonians 2 guy who ensures that you unsuspectingly fall away, crucify the Son of God afresh, which is the entire point of why Revelation 13, 8, the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, and the time of the abomination of desolation, 1290 days of Revelation 13. Please see the prior series, Ushering Eternal Righteousness, in here in this link. Denial of our Lord's eternal divinity is in reality to crucify him afresh and put him to shame. And how about this? It is equal to all the blasphemies in Revelation 13. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. 
Then, one ought to consider what it means to crucify Christ afresh. When it comes to the first angel, But are you to say, you don't believe in the Nicene Creed of the Little Horn, the basis of their teaching magisterium of the Eternal Son Doctrine, or the Arian Version? Same thing. The unpardonable means one kicks Christ to the gutter and denies John 1, 1 to 3. It also means you don't have the first angel's message of Revelation 14. And since this is the number one issue during the time of the 1290 days, as Jesus warned in Matthew 24, 15, which is the time of the abomination of desolations, this being the number one issue, it means your voice is in total denial of any testimony of Jesus. which at the same time is in concert with the blasphemy of the eighth king of Revelation 13, 4 to 6. And there you have the unpardonable sin perfected in sinful flesh. But that's not all. As you consider Hebrew chapter 7 and 8, a testimony of Melchizedek and the heavenly sanctuary and then, disbelieving John 1, 1, there were two divines in beginning. One crucifies Christ in open shame again and saying the Neoplatonism of the brought forth Son. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, it's impossible to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So the number one issue is about crucifying to themselves the Son of God afresh. The impossibility of the thinking that one is okay with the Godhead of monotheism, whether it's the little horn view or the Aryan or otherwise, the fact remains it endorses the false schema of the Second Thessalonians 2 scenario, and that doctrine is putting the eternal Logos of John 1, Christ, to a continual open shame. It means you have no awareness of the depths of unrighteousness, let alone the pristine beauty of, a, of eternal righteousness by faith. Since all mysteries of the little horn supreme doctrine include the eternal sun doctrine, here is the conclusion of Laodicea's acceptance, fundamental beliefs two and four. That acceptance as a fundamental belief is saying first angel's message is based on the Trinity doctrine. Ignorance is one thing, but when the issue is posed, Laodicea do not have a valid answer, since it's an apostate, backsliding church that shortens the distance between itself and the little horn and spiritualism. Unpardonable? What contributes to the unpardonable? of Matthew 12, 31, was the rejection of Alpha in reference to the first angel. Yes, this is true, but why? The first angel is a most solemn warning. And the fact is, God said, it is the precursor to the mark of the beast. There is none other than the Alos Paracletos, the another comforter, from John 14, 16 and 26, who confirms the first 
Angel's Warning, which is John 1.1. 1, 1. 2. Eternal Divines. Further, the mark of the beast is simply the global application of the false Shema. Let me read that again. The mark of the beast equals the global application of the false Shema. Whereas the true Shema of the New Testament was rejected in relation to the elimination of the first angel's warning, which again is John 1.1. 1, 1. Laodicea accepted the monotheistic central doctrine of the little horn as have all others. The result is shipwreck on the rocks, out at sea, which is as seen in reference to the events in relation to mystery Babylon the Great. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Take note of the fact that the fall of the second angel is described in Revelation 17, 12 to 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. They shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. As well as Revelation 18, these are literal yet future events. And then comes EGW's statement that the glory of the Lord departed from Israel, although the many continued the forms of religion. In other words, the good ship Zion stranded out at sea at the terminus of Luke 21, 24, and doesn't make it into port. Wavy lines. This is in reference to the expulsion of the corporate, in reference to the Lima text and Luke 21, 24, and what was accorded, and the result was the missing three angels in the new Seventh-day Adventist, Laodicean logo, and this is the addition of the common witness of the BEM, Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry, equals three wavy lines. That was the Lima text in 1982. What happened in 1980? equals the fundamental beliefs two and four, impacted the true Shema so severely 
it is the unpardonable sin. No wonder corporate probation of Laodicea closed, and even to this day, they have absolutely no explanation in John 1.1. 1, 1. Why is it important? Laodicea accepted the false Shema, which is the mark of the beast. And the consequence that is imposed and found in the second portion of the Deuteronomy 6.4, which is verse 8, the remembrance on the forehead and the right hand. Doesn't that sound the same as Revelation 13 and the mark of the beast? Yes, this is correct. Since they attribute being begotten in eternity as being brought forth from the Father, whereas John 1 1 presents two everlasting fathers, and that is what no one believes from Isaiah 9 6 to 7, let alone Hebrews 7 1 to 3. There cannot be any tampering of John 1 1. It's as plain as day and night. Many years ago, without this understanding of John 1 and the first angel, it was back then studying the theology behind reincarnation. It was obvious that a demon spirit had stated in the book that at creation, Christ was the first emanated Son of God. The trap had been set and accepted since the false Shimama has already been accepted, and the theology behind the Alpha of Deadly Heresy extends from the time of Philo up to the Omega, which will be of a startling nature, is yet to unfold in reference to what Jesus stated about a snare over the inhabitants of the earth. Conclusion The unfolding of these emanation theories results in sparks of their own kindling, and the result will culminate in a tsunami of miracles and communications from the spirit world and manifestations of supermen that will supposedly have perfected the manipulation of the forces of the universe equals demons in relation to so-called perfection of higher consciousness. That is why they worship the dragon as well as the beast. The siren call of higher consciousness and the belief that you are an emanation and are at one with the universe when it is that you stop believing in an external God who died for your sins. You have the ability to exalt your destiny. This forms a part of the I am God mantra that will take the world by storm. There is a biblical answer for that in He Who Made's Matrix which equals John 17 and Psalms 8, as well as Jesus' statement, which he quoted from Psalms 82, verse 6, which says, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. your gods and children of the Most High. That is when you accept the correct matrix. The acceptance of the false ma matrix equals the latter part of the verse. But ye shall die as men. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said ye are gods and all ye are children of the Most High but ye shall die like men. Wow. That was very revealing. About Christ, crucifying Christ afresh, leading to him to an open shame, the unpardonable sin. I hope that helps. 
and whoever's reading this will come to a knowledge of the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. God bless. Any questions, please contact us. Till next time.